OK, we are live. Uh, well, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome all newcomers. Welcome all our regulars. Hope you've had a nice Easter break. Um, I'm not going to waffle on because I really want to give as much oxygen to Tony as possible. But I will just quickly say that um, for those who don't know, we're the, the Riot Science Club. Um, we're an initiative to raise awareness and provide training in, in reproducible, interpretable, open and transparent scientific practices. I've put links in the Q&A message board uh, to our website, which is currently down, but you can catch us on Twitter. All of our slides, including Tony's today, will be uploaded to our OSF and a recording of the talk will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. Um, there are upcoming talks which you can also check out on our various Twitter handles um, and also on our website when it's up and running. Anyway, so I'm going to get over now to Tony and make a quite a clunky transition. So Tony Pelosi is a consultant psychiatrist at the Priory Hospital in Glasgow. He's also an honorary professor at the University of Glasgow and he has training in psychiatry and epidemiology at uh, the Institute of Psychiatry, as it was then known. It's now the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at IOPPN at King's College London and also Johns Hopkins. Um, Tony has pretty much single handedly, um, although we might not like that uh, um, characterization, but he has pretty much kept on live support, I would say, the whole Ising affair which came to a head a few years ago in 2019, where in an extreme case of optimism and ambition, he um, sought to, to get published a critique on Isaac's 100th birthday, which he will go into, so I won't steal his thunder, but eventually it found its home, not in the um, Personality and Individual Differences paper that Isaac founded, but also in the Journal of Health Psychology. And that triggered on a whole spate of things that have unfolded at King's, which Tony will go into during his talk. So, Tony, I'm going to hand the keys over to you. Thank you so much for giving your time today. And you're looking absolutely uh, dapper yeah. in your in your COVID hair haircut. Which COVID? <laughs> Post COVID, yeah, legal haircut. Yeah, good. Uh, and is that me? Uh, uh, yeah, you can go back to the beginning. That, that's me at the beginning now of my oh. slides there. OK, the Mike Pence one, yeah. OK, the, about all Mike yours. Pence. And, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, hoping that even though this relates to, to work that was done by, by, by Hans Eisenk and, and others yeah. decades ago, I'm hoping that, that, that there's a, a kind of relevance to it all, and it, it was just that I, when when Mike Pence was was put in charge of the the coronavirus um, response in the United States, I, I just came across a, a mention in in one of the newspapers saying, you know, Mike Pence, he didn't, he, there were questions about his approach to public health. Uh, and and so you know I was able just to go back and there he was when he, he was in standing for for Congress in in the year two thousand and uh, um, the the uh, I, I, it's just I, I saw there where he was giving part of his his campaign work he was saying um, you know um, it, it, you know. Uh, you smoking. The people say smoking kills millions of Americans each year. You see, despite the hysteria from the political class and the media, smoking doesn't kill. In fact, two out of every three smokers not die from a smoking-related illness. Nine out of ten smokers does not contract lung, lung cancer. Which is fair enough. And I'm saying, I've, I've I've read that before. I've read that before. What what he's saying? Now, I mean, he's a he's a. Uh, uh, a politician and uh, politicians uh, within a, a, a democracy, he is allowed to make statements like that. I suspect whether uh, well, it's, it's what one what one thinks about it is another matter, and it's up to individuals what their views are. And uh, and there's a and he he was getting money there from the the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, the Political Action Committee, which is the workers that. R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, and I 
modest comp contribution there to his to his um, campaign committee. And and we know everyone knows these things go on and how how our society deals with that uh, it will will run and run and how we deal with it politically. Um, the the tobacco company has a, a right to to advertise. It has a right to uh, fund scientists as well. Uh, whether they had a right, whether they were, and, and I think they had a right at the time to, for example, uh, um, sponsor the Flintstones in the sixties, even after, and this was. Fred Flintstone and Wilma, his wife, they loved a Winston cigarette. It was really great, great the taste of, he loved the taste of Winston. Uh, whether that was a, a appropriate that they should have behaved like that as, as information was coming out about the dangers of cigarettes is another matter. And one that, uh, that many, many people have debated and will continue to debate over the years. And it'll probably never end. Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to declare an interest now. Uh, uh, just to, before I start my 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 talk, and 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 my declaration is that my family sold cigarettes, and uh, I think essentially all other tobacco products in an economically deprived area of Glasgow for 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 over a century we did it. Uh, I would add we we, we sold, uh, even though I say so myself, uh, some very very tasty ice cream. Uh, that was our main that was our main product. But uh, as with every shop of that nature, as with every cafe, we sold cigarettes. So uh, uh, that is my, I think my only uh, my, my only interest around this or financial type interest around this, and it's in the past. And 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 I'm, I'm so without. Preamble. I'm, I'm kind of. I'm going to start my talk about Hans Eisenk. I, I've, I've, uh, I've actually got myself into a bit of trouble with my family over this talk because uh, uh, it's a talk on, uh, as, as, as one of these talks online in the days of coronavirus, and it's, it's certainly my, my. My my wife uh, uh, recently was going on about you know what 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 do you miss most you know what she misses most about the lockdown and it was kind of one of these conversations you have as a, a couple of kind of it got kind of kind of dreamy and almost romantic saying oh do you remember we used to go to that restaurant remember we used to take the boys there it wasn't that nice oh we miss that some I hope we'll get back to that. And 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 we're both getting a, 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 one of these lovely conversations, and I think I think I was getting a bit dreamy. He said, "What do you miss most, Tony?" I said, "I, I miss giving talks to people." Uh, and I goes, "What? What? You not missing out? You not missing out with us? You not missing out with the family?" I said, "No, that's not. It's not what I meant. It's not what I meant." So, but I do very much miss, and, and you don't you. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. I, I really do miss uh, giving talks like this. It would be, it would be awfully nice to be giving this to an audience. Um, I don't know if I'm being a bit forward, but if in the future people did want a, a talk with, at an audience with the discussants invited, uh, uh, you know where to, you know where to come on this and other subjects as well. But it is amazing how I miss it. And and but this talk is about. Uh, as I uh, hope most of you will recognise, or maybe all will recognise, Hans Eisenk, who my understanding is that, uh, sent, uh, that the, many people would claim that the, the leading psychologist of his generation uh, across the world, certainly the leading British psychologist of his generation, uh, and he certainly considered himself uh, maybe the leading psychologist of all time. And, and I'm going to be talking, an enormously prodigious man, but I'm going to be focusing on his work, on the, the, the work that he did in, in, on fatal diseases. And his work went back to the 1960s, but um, he uh, it was uh, very much, uh, uh, so it was work in the 1960s. I'm, I'm going to be focusing on the work Although one could criticise work that he did in the in the sixties, seventies, and early eighties, 
I'm going to be focusing on work that he, he did with, in collaboration with this man, uh, 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 Professor Grossarth Matichek, who n no one quite knows his full background, but uh, he's, he, he's variously described as a sociologist, sometimes described as a physician, sometimes described as a psychologist, or, or, or all of those. Um, and uh, he and Isaac, and, and he, he has a, 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 a clinical institute in Heidelberg where he was obviously seeing patients using kind of complementary techniques of treatment, uh, 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 including psychological input for people with various illnesses. And, and he and Isaac teamed up uh, in, in the mid 80s. Uh, or, or, or a bit before, and, and started producing some really uh, amazing epidemiological and clinical research. And I, I'm going to try and uh, quickly go through this. Uh, I hope people will have a chance to read the paper I did, which or the papers I did that, that summarise this in more detail, but just quickly going through the personality types that Isaac and Grothart Matichek came up with. And this is very much Isaac's and Grothart Matichek's personality types. Grothart Matichek had previously talked about other personality types and, and what they may be relating to. But when he teamed up with Isaac, these four personality types initially em emerged as very much as, as their, uh, their, their, their the, the main hypotheses that they wanted to test. And, uh, and they were based on mainly Zenkin theories, I think, about interpersonal repression and also from cl early clinical observations by Grossarth Matichek. And the personality topology, very, very briefly, is described as the cancer prototype, passivity in the face of stressful stimulation from the outside. But there's lots of very, very complex, differing descriptions of that cancer prone type. And ischemic heart disease prone personality an inability to leave in an unsatisfactory situation, which constantly increases people's anger and hostility. And that's from Mize and Gross and And a mixed type and a healthy autonomous personality. Uh, and uh, the, the, I'm going to describe the results. There was, there's many, many studies they did in this area, but I'm just going to describe the results on three uh, observational epidemiological studies uh, one of them involving 1,026 people in Heidelberg that really were, they, they seemed reasonably representative uh, uh, middle-aged middle -aged people, the 1,026. A study earlier in Yugoslavia with, once again, a reasonably representative sample of, of people uh, living in, in, in the Kravinka in, in the, then Yugoslavia. And a less representative group, but three separate, a less representative group of a th over 1,500 highly stressed but healthy middle-aged people. But they, they were otherwise healthy, but were highly stressed, uh, emotionally stressed. Uh, and I'm just going to romp through the results where uh, combining I, I, for the for the purpose of this talk, combining those three studies, and and just say that the the, the cancer prone type and the coronary heart disease prone type, these weren't rare personality types. They make up even in the fairly representative sample about a quarter about a quarter each of subjects. So over a half of subjects had these these disease prone types of personality, and then the healthy autonomous type was almost a third, and then this mixed type. And, and just to, to have a look at that slide, uh, that is an amazing slide. I've deliberately left out the results for coronary heart disease there. I've, I've left that out for now. And, and just talking about the, the mortality after a decade of people who had been found, to, uh, who had been interviewed and categorised in each of those personality types, each of those four personality types. And uh, uh, I, I, um, I presented the, the, those numbers, and I just, I just adapted those numbers and worked out the relative risk 
for for each type of a uh, personality type uh, and present it in this way and and if you just look there that the the healthy type of nine or four six people only 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 nine only one percent died of heart disease so and, and i've put that as the baseline for the relative risk so that's the re a relative risk of one and, and there's this mixed type uh, uh, where not, not particularly unhealthy in, in Isaacs and Grotter Maticek's view, there's a, they had a relative risk of four, 21 out of 570 people dying. And then, but then the cancer prone type, so the people that they're categorized as prone to developing a cancer based on their theories, they were actually, they were actually seven times more likely to die of heart disease. So it wasn't quite precise in regard to them being cancer prone using their hypotheses because that, that was seven times increased relative uh, seven times seven times more likely than the healthy uh, subjects had the participants to die of heart disease and, and it's and you, when, when i have an audience it's usually at this time and then ask the audience just to compare for example say, say you smoked uh, about 20 cigarettes per day uh, and with other other things being equal compared with a non-smoker, you know, it, you, with a neighbour, but other things being 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 equal, uh, what would the kind of relative risk of being a twenty cigarettes per day man or, or woman uh, who, uh, in regard to dying of heart disease over the ensuing decade? Uh, and and the relative risk and and uh, I am surprised sometimes to see that that people aren't quite aware of just how much more likely you are if you're a twenty a day smoker or a forty a day smoker to develop heart disease or die of heart disease. And say for a twenty a day person, it, it varies widely depending on the study, but maybe you're about twice as likely to die of heart disease if you, if you're a heavy smoker because there's so many other risk factors for for developing heart disease that, that are impacting on that. So there you are, I mean, this is, this is a big, big relative risk. You're seven times more likely with that particular personality type. But I'm going to, I'm going to come on now then to the act to the results for the coronary heart disease prone patients. And 208 of them out of 818 died of heart disease after about 10 years. I've been categorised as being prone to that heart disease. And if you compare that then with the healthy type, gives a relative risk of 27. Now, here we are to, speaking to a, the, a, a reproducibility and science club. It, that's one study, or, or, or one, that's one table arising from three studies with fairly consistent findings across all of them. If that were to be reproduced, that would be the most important ever finding in the, the most important finding ever in the study of ischemic heart disease, which is the, the biggest killer, has been the biggest killer, uh, uh, biggest cause, main cause of death in the West, in the developed world. So, so quite a claim is 27 times relative risk for this personality type in this in these three cohort studies. But what about the cancer prone type? And once again, I've left out the results so at the moment for for the, those who are deemed to be cancer prone. Uh, and one, once again, big numbers, big numbers of patients over these three studies and the healthy patient, the, the ones with a healthy personality really did not die of cancer. Three out of 946, and I've given that, the re I've called that now the baseline relative risk. The mixed type, once again, quite unhealthy, there's a four times relative risk for cancer. This is all cancers. And the heart disease prone type, a, a 14 times relative risk of dying of cancer over about 10 years, 36 out of 218, as opposed to 300 out, three out of Nine and four six, and once again, this would be where I would ask an audience: if you're a twenty a day smoker, uh, 
uh, over, over a twenty a day smoker from teenage years. So over over the years, twenty a day smoker. How much more likely are you to die of lung cancer compared with, say, your neighbour? All other things being equal, uh, who, who's a non-smoker, and and the relative risk there for a twenty a day man for lung cancer would maybe be about ten times more likely. For a very heavy smoker, 40 a day, man or woman, you might be talking about maybe 25 times more likely for lung cancer. If it was something like uh, pancreatic cancer, you'd maybe if you're a, a very heavy smoker, a 40 a day uh, smoker, you would be talking about maybe five or six times more likely. If you're, if it was maybe a prostate cancer, if you're a very heavy smoker compared to your neighbour, my understanding is you can't, there isn't really an increased risk due to smoking or relating to, associated with smoking for the development of prostate cancer. Some debate about breast cancer, but if it is, it's, it's you're talking about a relative risk of 1.05, 1.1, 1.3, 1.4. So, so very, very. For for most cancers, there is no uh, clear association. But for a dozen cancers, especially lung cancer, throat cancer, oropharyngeal cancers, there's these high relative risks, about 10, 15, 20, depending on the severity of smoking, the the amount of smoking, and the length of time smoking. So, 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 uh, so that brings us then to the cancer prone type who were assessed and then followed up over these 10 years to see what their, their results were. Were, were Gross, Arth, Matichek and Isaac right to say that these 900 patients were indeed cancer, or, or 900 participants, participants in, in, who they found in the community, not patients, Nine, nine, these 900 people were they cancer prone and and there was a 347 of them died of cancer after about 10 years and that was all cancers it wasn't lung cancer it wasn't any particular cancer all cancers and that and they, that gives a relative risk of 121 and, we, and when we originally wrote about this we said that's the the biggest ever relative risk identified in non-infectious disease epidemiology. And once again, it, it was done over three studies, all with similar results. Um, and if any other group found that, 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 that would be the most important ever finding in the history of medicine, if, any, if, if other groups were to find that and uh, reproduce even a similar result to that in, in an observation. The most important finding ever in the history of medicine. So, um, I think it was obviously I think driving it at this stage. So we'll see, well, this is just, uh, these are just observational results. What about, what if you could then start affecting people's personality? Could you actually make a difference to their risks of death from these conditions? And, and um, I, I, it so happened that Grossart Maticek had done another massive study of about 30,000 subjects who he interviewed in 1973, and they yielded subjects for randomised controlled trials, which I think was clearly clean and doing to see if he could change people's personalities or alter people's personalities in such a way that it could improve their, their health. And the type of psychotherapy that they used was something called creative innovation behaviour therapy. I would love to go into it if I had time to, to describe what it was like. Uh, I might have a, a, a chance later on when I uh, go, go into it further, but uh, later on in the talk to describe what it was. It sound, comes across though as a bit like cognitive behavioural therapy. It's variously described with some actually psychodynamic type psychotherapy thrown in and also some relaxation methods, um, uh, distress tolerance methods thrown in. And once again, they got the most remarkable findings. So, they, so there's the 92, they had 92 heart disease prone subjects. They randomised 46 of them to get 
individual psychotherapy from Professor Grossarth Matichek himself. He did the psychotherapy himself. And they were heart disease prone, and only three out of 46, if you got psychotherapy, died of heart disease, and six out of, th out of 46 died uh, 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 if you got the therapy. But that compares with 16 out of 46 dying of heart disease if you if you weren't randomised to that psychotherapy, and 13 out of 46 dying of other causes. So massive differences with this psychotherapeutic psychotherapeutic input. 13 years over over the 13 years before, and then follow up over 13 years. Uh, the, the, by, by by 13 years later, there's huge differences in mortality. Something that never been seen in any other trial of uh, any psychological therapy, probably in any in any looking at any outcome really. And but, but what about there was a hundred cancer prone subjects who were also randomised, and if you got talking with Grossarth Matichek and got psychotherapy Matichek, you did not die of cancer over the next thirteen years. None of them died of cancer. Five died of other causes. Once again, all cancers were looked at. None died, and 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 here's the another result for individual psychotherapy. Um, sixteen, well, fifteen died of other causes, but sixteen out of fifty died of cancer. So my goodness, they were lucky if they were randomised to talk with Professor Grossarth Matichek. Hey. Once again, if, th if those results were uh, reproduced by anybody, taking into account the results of observational studies and Professor Isaac felt that this backed up very much the results he was getting in his in observational studies, his, his big uh, cohort studies. If those were uh, reproduced by anybody else, that would not be the most important finding ever in medicine. It would be the most important finding ever in science. Because they've, well, they've, they've, they've sorted cancer, sorted the cause and sorted out how, how, how to prevent it. So, so it really need, needs it needs a replication, as Professor Isaac always say. These things need replication, and it just so happened that they, they, he, he and I, Grosshart Machek, must have got talking and saying, you know, you know, it's expensive individual psychotherapy. It's it's expensive. It's very labour intensive. Wouldn't it be great if we could do group psychotherapy using uh, creative innovation behaviour therapy? And it so happened that Rosarth Matichek had indeed. Oh, oh! Before I come to that, it, it was this thing because because I, I know that the riots club. They, you always gone about this the 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 use and misuse of statistical significance. That the the eyes uh, of my my check going about this study seems to prove a high level of confidence. And they, they point out as all statistical tests are well outside the p equals zero point zero one level. Well, you don't need to do statistical uh, significance testing when there are numbers like that that are emerging. But nevertheless, they, they, he, they, they seem to think it was very important that he points out to people that the P was less than 0 0.01 for these findings. But so, and, but it so happened that the Grosshaft Magic hadn't just done individual psychotherapy, an individual psychotherapy trial, he had done a group therapy with 10 to 20 people in each group, where he and some, some trained students uh, did group therapy with these stressed but healthy people who were cancer prone or coronary artery disease prone according to their personality, 245 in each group. So 245 randomized, sorry, to each treatment arm and 245 of them were treated with group therapy using creative innovation behaviour therapy. And after seven years, 20% of the subjects who got group therapy had died, and 76% of those who didn't get the group therapy had died. Now, taken along with the observational studies, 
the individual psychotherapy study, and now this group therapy study involving big, big numbers for a psychological therapy trial, big numbers, 490 participants. I, I would put it to you, that is not, that is not, they're not claiming the most important findings in the history of medicine, and they're not claiming the most important findings in the history of science. Uh, Professor Isink and Professor Grosarmetric are claiming for themselves the pinnacle of all human achievement. Now, I always hope when I, when I say that an audience, will I get a laugh out of that? I think, I, I personally think that Professor Isink, the late Professor Isink, if he was, if, if I had said that during the 90s when he was still alive, in an audience, I, I, did, I did always want to 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 give a uh, give a like get, get, you know debate this with him. I think if I had said that to Professor Isaac, he would have nodded. See, you've got you've got it absolutely right, Dr. Closey. I think he believed well, he he would have no problem with that notion, and until he was pinned down on certain things, but. So there you are, they're claiming the, the pinnacle of all human achievement, but that's not all. They're claiming more than that. Because, you know, group therapy is also labour intensive, as, as like in digital life therapy. What if you could just do it by getting the patient, the, 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 in the participant or the, the individual to do the work? So with five hours of discussion, they had a, a, a pamphlet on creative innovation behaviour therapy. They did it. it, it Grossamerchik said he had done a, a randomised trial, 600 treated, of 1,200 people, 600 randomised to getting this pamphlet. And pamphlet is, the, is their word, or not getting the pamphlet and, and, and discussion of its con contents. And as I, I was discussing with Sam earlier, you know, uh, they claim a lot for their wee pamphlet. And here is their wee pamphlet. Or at least that's about two thirds of it. Now, if, if anyone is, I don't know, I don't know whether I, people should then read it quickly and see if it will help their health in the future. Uh, I suppose it will, it's, it's, it's in, in the papers by Isaac and Grossarth Matichek. But it's things like their pamphlet is saying uh, things like, what can you do when you have no idea what else you can do? You can only accept that state of affairs, but continue to observe your own behaviour in order to discover the conditions which prevent you from achieving satisfaction and happiness. So some, 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 some good and wise words there. Um, and that's the rest of it. That's the full, that's the full pamphlet. I was actually quite interested in this. How do you achieve autonomous self-regulation? You're in a state of autonomous self-regulation when you succeed through your own activities. For example, sport or jogging, refreshing sleep, production of good interpersonal relations to achieve an equilibrium and contentment and to respond appropriately to the deviations from this equilibrium. And it goes on about, you know, don't drink too much coffee. Uh, I actually couldn't help but wonder when, when reading descriptions of auto the autonomous personality that wasn't kind of the way Professor Isaac describes himself in some of his autobiographical writings. It was almost, I, I, I mean, I'm speculating here. I do wonder if he, he thought to himself, if only more people were more like me, they, they may actually be a lot healthier. I think that's the only speculative bit of the, the talk. Um, and there we are. So, Having claimed the pinnacle of all human achievement, there they are. They've done, gone and done a reproduct. They, they have uh, they've they've replicated in this other study sit with this big randomised trial. After 13 years, 32% of those given the pamphlet were dead. Very few of them have cancer. 83% of the of the untreated were dead. Now. Uh, 
I, 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 I would say that's all. All of that is from published literature, and I, I think it adds up. Just those results and just that selection of results. There's actually loads of other things that could have drawn on, including slowing down death for people who had widespread metastases from the from ca ca various cancers. Uh, loads of other findings, and I, I felt that those results in the peer reviewed literature were were a, a scientific scandal. But there was also a terrible, I, I, when I was read a bit more deeply into it, I noticed this terrible ethical scandal. And it's in within this, this paper here, changes in degree of sclerosis. So um, changes in, in uh, uh, sclerosis in the arteries as a function of, of, uh, of, of, of getting uh, this psychological therapy. And it's in behaviour, published in behaviour research and therapy. Um, uh, uh, behaviour research therapy, of course, is, a, is a, a, a journal that was founded by Hans Eising, and he was the first editor of it. Um, and uh, they describe then, see, how can, how can you tell if someone has abnormalities of their, of their arteries? And, and one of the ways you can do it is you, you, you have a look at the back of people's eyes with an ophthalmoscope, and you, and you can see then the small the small arteries in the retina at the back of the eye, and 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 here this is a this is a picture of a really nice healthy uh, retina. Hope my retina is like that, and 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 this is the the optic disc where the 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 the, 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 the optic nerve goes in there, and the, and the, and the and the veins and the arteries are, are all going to the optic disc. A nice. Uh, healthy looking blood vessels and and uh, Eising and, and Grossarth Maticek they then describe in, in great detail the appearances the unhealthy appearances at the back of the eye um, and it would be for example this where the blood vessels look less healthy and the, and the ve veins are kind of are, are swollen up and there's a blurring of, of, of the optic disc there and they've got these things called cotton wool spots and, and hemorrhages into the retina and you get that with very severe high blood pressure and that would be a very worrying sign and if, and if a doctor if a doctor found that in a patient is complaining say of a bit of headache if they looked in their eye and found that, they, they would get them seen in the hospital and admitted really that same day. And then especially if you've got something like this, which Eisengroth and Maciek described this appearance of full-blown lesions of what's called malignant hypertension with a complete blurring of the optic disc. Uh, that is a very, very sinister sign. And people... With that appearance, unless that's treated, really, you could expect to be dead within a year or two, unless that's treated. Uh, and I remember, I, 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 when I was doing general medicine, I didn't like these patients coming in. I, I found it quite a scary situation trying to bring these patients, cost to bring these patients' blood pressure down. Um, and uh, and actually, actually, there's a great tragedy. It's worth looking up. A, a, a poor, a, a poor a optician, tragically. It must have uh, with a, a, a young lad uh, presenting, uh, just getting his eyes tested. And the, she, the, the, somebody took pictures of the back of this this lad's eyes. I think it's a routinely done thing now. And she uh, she looked at the back of the eye and somehow or other missed this appearance of the of the optic disc. This this uh, it's what's called papilledema. God knows what happened and hadn't looked at the pictures, but the pictures were there as evidence. And the poor poor boy died over the ensuing months, and she was she was actually charged with and found guilty of manslaughter uh, by gross negligence. I believe it was changed on appeal, but one of these terrible tragedies where a clinician misses something uh, and was actually found guilty of manslaughter, although it was it was lessened on on appeal. Uh, the poor family and the poor clinician. God knows how it happened. But my God, Eisen and Grossarth Maticek describe 41 people who had the appearance of retinal appearance of malignant hypertension 
with his huge systolic blood pressure, 207 millimetres of mercury. Normal hub blood pressure for someone who's middle age, I think about 130 millimetres of mercury. So, so it's, these people had malignant hypertension. And so what did they do? Did they, did they send them up to hospital? Did they get their, their general practitioner, send them as an emergency, their general practitioner, get them, get, make sure they were admitted? No, they arranged for them to get psychotherapy from Professor Ross Arthmatajek. And a year later, they checked about their eyes again, and this time it was 51 with findings in their eyes of malignant hypertension. And they, they say that, that 13 years later, uh, 43 out of the 51, I think it was, had died of presumably vascular disease, um, certain heart disease and other vascular, uh, mainly vascular disease, mainly blood vessel diseases. Now, I mean, that is that as described in that paper in behavioural research and therapy, that peer reviewed paper in behavioural research and therapy, that is one of the most eh, unethical in fact, unethical is, is an inadequate expression for it. And I tried to get into print with this, and I think I've managed to get it now on, on the Riot's website, that that is a criminally negligent, that's not an, just unethical, that's a criminally negligent description of, of, a, of some of a randomised tr trial, of, of, of what they did within a randomised trial. If it's any consolation, I don't believe for a minute that it ever happened took place. Uh, there's just so many reasons why there's no way they could have found that number of people with malignant hypertension. I just don't believe it. And so, Grossard Matichek, who's still alive, he's off the hook. If it's true, really, th that was criminal negligence, and it's not for me to then say what should happen. But, uh, uh, but I don't believe it's true. I, 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 I don't believe for a minute that it actually happened. And I, I did say to Isaac, I did manage when I was in an audience with Isaac saying, look, you can't have this in the in the literature, or keep that in the literature and trying to explain to him why it was so outrageous. Anyway, myself and, and Lewis Appleby managed to get into the got into the British Medical Journal with a load of with a load of support and, uh, and help from the from the editor of the British Medical Journal, Richard Smith. Uh, we got this this paper into the, the into the British Medical Journal in 19, back in 1992. And uh, we thought when that was published that this would all then get sorted. There'd be an inquiry into this work. I think one of the, the issues was that it was very carefully looked at by the British Medical Journal's lawyers. And so it, they, they did change the wording. I, I always remember thinking, gosh, I wonder if people will think I'm as crisp and clear a writer as that, as, as I'm Lewis Appleby is a brilliant writer. But when the lawyers got it, my God, have a look at it. There were some lovely ways they phrased things. But they were phrased in ways that would mean that we couldn't get, as they saw, we couldn't get sued and the British Medical Journal couldn't get sued. But the problem is, I think then for things like journalists reading like this, reading a paper like this, they were saying, oh, this is this is amazing, a, a, a big problem. But, you know, it's it's a, a big, big controversy. And we weren't really ever able to say what we really believed. And Richard Smith wasn't really ever able to say, to, to have us saying in his journal what he wanted us to believe. And and there was a, some back and forth with, with Ising. We, we wrote another article. And then things just then fizzled out. And nothing much happened over the years, uh, and and I I'm going back from the ethical scandal to this multi-layered scientific scandal. I put it to you that there was layers and layers that are actually there are more layers being added to this scientific scandal. The Eisengrothemar gave an address to the Institute of Psychiatry, and and we me and Lewis Appleby published in the British Medical Journal, and then again I published in the. Committee on Publication Ethics at a conference, an abstract there, a conference with theirs. Just there had to be, there has to be an inquiry into this. Some people have to look at it. And the Institute of Psychiatry washed their hands of that affair. And Isaac remained an emeritus professor until he died. In their annual reports, you would see he always had more papers than anybody else 
in the entire Institute of Psychiatry by far. And certainly in those years leading up to his death in 1997, after, after publications in the British Medical Journal uh, and all the criticism from us and, and also from others, it wasn't just us, there was much more detailed criticisms of it. There, there there would be these papers being part of the annual report of the Institute of Psychiatry. And every time I saw it, I said, well, how can this possibly be happening? How can this be allowed? How could it be going on? And then, and, and also in 19, and when, not, when the Institute weren't doing anything about it, I said, well, I'll, I'll make a complaint to the regulator, point out the scientific flaws, but also he's, he's claiming uh, this grossly unethical treatment trial. And they looked at it, they said they looked at it carefully and we've since been in further contact with them, uh, but it wasn't appropriate to do a further investigation, any further investigation. And then this other scientific scandal, the, the papers uh, can, continue to be widely cited uh, uh, in, in the scientific, and I think very important, the non-scientific literature, you can self-help manuals, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, health, health type, uh, complementary medicine type uh, uh, literature uh, they cited there, and, and and uncritical citations in undergraduate psychology textbooks. Sometimes, having said that, sometimes critical psych citations in undergraduate psychology textbooks, including by uh, God help us, uh, Professor Ising son, clearly aware of how un unsatisfactory, how, how, how scandalous this was, but having to frame it in, in very complicated terms, I mean, uh, uh, within, his, within his textbook. But sometimes very uncritically cited. It was included in meta-analyses, and, and uh, along would come these extreme outliers in meta-analyses of the association between personality and disease, sometimes enough to influence the, the overall results of meta-analysis. They, they've been included in large, and, and so people doing a, a huge big studies in France, a huge big epidemiological studies of, I think, gas workers in France, you know, a, a vital big study, and, and say, well, we, we must use some personality measures. And obviously look and say, oh gosh, this looks uh, something important. And they included that in, in their, their court studies and showing uh, either no, no associations or, or very small associations in these findings. And then uh, they, they've been used in, in the, the, these measures, the, these measures of personality types have been used in people who are desperately and dying with cancer uh, around the world, and, and especially studies in Japan. And then this, then again, this multi-layer scientific scandal um, Isaac's research trainees and younger research collaborators have tried to defend his work on cancer and other fatal diseases. And there is this, there is this society that uh, uh, some of you will know, know it, uh, I don't know whether even some of you can be uh, members of it, some of the audience can be members of it, the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences, which appears to have been, with, Isaac was certainly a co-founder, but I think it is seen as it was his society. And I've, so I've been reading this thinking, how could this happen? How could this be still allowed to happen? And any time I would read about things, uh, reading stuff in, when I was in the library, I'd look up personality and individual differences, his other journal, and maybe there's things from the International, International Society, the study of individual differences, kind of egging him on about he's such a genius. You Sometimes when he was alive saying, you are such a genius, Hans. How you? How can you be so clever? And it, it's it's there uh, in the literature. Uh, one chap, uh, a, ch a chap, a psychologist from Denmark, comparing him to his face to 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 Johann Sebastian Bach or Mozart, a scientific equivalent of of Bach or Mozart. And 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 I think a, a lot of people were encouraging Isaac in this regard, that he was a genius. Isaac chose to believe then that Grossarf Matichek was a genius. And somehow he got it into his head that that would make genius squared and they could come up with results that nobody else could come up with. And for years then I was going about, you know, how could this happen? What? And I kept saying, I must try and do something more about it. And then about I think in the in the early 2000s, I think it was, 
there there was this uh, what happened was that the in, in the midst of all the political uh, amidst of all the legal cases against tobacco companies american lawyers said we want all of your papers they said to the tobacco in, uh, companies we want all of your papers as evidence we were subpoenaing them so that was every letter written, every memo written, every report that they'd written, every research report, every grant they'd given. And, and they're apparently in a huge big warehouse in Minnesota and there's one in Guildford, I think, in, 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 in England as well. They, so they subpoenaed all the documents of the, of the tobacco industry. And I do recommend that pe people should have a wee look at it. I mean, some of it is really shocking. And I remember uh, looking at it, and it, and it was this thing as I was, I was able then to download it. It's all on the internet, and you're able to download it. And and I do remember nearly falling off my chair, reading, when I was reading um, the minutes of uh, meetings, where the the German research, the German cigarette research uh, group, uh, doing research into the into tobacco. They were saying, you know, that it's so clear that this is, that Grossaf Marcek is a char charlatan. It was worth them giving him a grip money to, to show that he's, he's a charlatan and that the, 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 the work is, is, uh, is untrue. And then, and, but then reading on further, uh, nearly for almost, you say, well, but no, this, this is important work. Let's give him another. Give it. Let's give his group another fifty thousand Deutschmarks. And you got and and, and uh, there is available then all the letters to and from. I think sometimes expressing uh, skepticism about the results, but also giving him money to continue his work. And also, uh, you can get in the independent in the in these in the in in the documents library. And, the, and there he is, there is Professor Ising. Once again, how could this have happened? And he was being egged on by the tobacco industry. There's the, that's the chief executive of R.J. Reynolds giving uh, testimony to the Senate hearing on tobacco. And uh, some very well-known names of people who seem to give the tobacco industry research results that they wanted. And there was his right-hand man there, Professor Ising, who was doing stuff on Ray, under oath to, to courts, but and, and to the Senate hearings, talking about the results he'd found with Grossaf Matichek, amongst other results. And and so, so on it went. I kept saying I must do something about this, and then uh, I, I went down to London with my family, and I, I knew this was in in the Science Museum, and off I went to the Science Museum. And there was this, uh, it, it was a, an exhibition and it was celebrating, uh, it was set up in 2001, this, this, this exhibition, it was celebrating the advances in British psychology since, it's, since the founding of the British Psychological Society in 1901. And the dominant uh, part of the meeting of the, of the exhibition was Isink's laboratory where he was carrying out this work at the Bethlehem Hospital. And it was this thing I remember saying to my boys, boys, this is so important, this. This, this shows the fragility of science. You must appreciate that and it's, it, it's being allowed to go on and somehow science can't deal with this. And I do remember them saying, Dad, we wanted to go to the Natural History Museum. We didn't want to be here. Would you stop going on about this? But I insisted, there it was, uh, the bicycle laboratory, and keeping saying, I must do something more about this. But the re one of the reasons I, 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 was, I was saying that, but it's okay, I, me and Lewis Appleby and all these other uh, epidemiologists, science statisticians, psychologists who had been saying this was dodgy work and something must be done. I'm saying, it, it, we, haven't, we haven't been able to change it. I'm saying, but it's okay because the historians will sort this. This will be worked out, it was sorted out by historians. And I knew that Roderick Buchanan, who's a psychologist and a historian, a, 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 a historian of psychology, um, I knew he was working in this book, but it, it, it was years ago and he, I had spoken to him on the phone about this, on the record with all my concerns about it. 
and I knew he was working this, but nothing seemed to happen. It, 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 for, it, for, it, I was like, I wonder when that, I wonder when that book's coming out. I wonder if something's happened that it, 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 he's not seen it through because it, years have been on for years. Uh, and it turned out, uh, my understanding is that, that Rod had written his book and then gave it to Oxford University Press and they showed it, they then gave it to their lawyers instead of him giving each chapter as he went along to, to be seen by the lawyers. And the lawyers held him up tremendously and he had to revise uh, much of what, uh, advise various parts of his book, including the chapter in regard to to his smoking, health, personality. Uh, but I do remember I was in London at the time and I was going uh, in, in Bloomsbury and I looked in that big sh bookshop window, but it was at, uh, uh, the, the, the store had closed and there was playing with fire. I didn't know it was coming out. And I was wondering if I could bang on the door and maybe speak to the security man saying, look, this I need this book urgently because I want to see what he said. Has he it sorted out? Couldn't, could, couldn't go. I had to go the next morning to get it. Uh, but I was able to go onto the internet and see, and there it was, uh, the, the table of contents. Uh, the uh, and and it's, it's still there. This table of contents is still there on the internet. And chapter nine was smoking cancer and the F word. And, and I say, at last, it, it's going to be said, it's going, the, the, the F word, the fraud word, is going to be used by this historian at long last. And I, I, got, I, I got back I, I, the next morning, got the book, and was flicking through the book to try and find it. And in the actual book, the table of contents is chapter nine, smoking, cancer, and the final frontier. So the lawyers didn't allow him to, they made him change the, the title of his chapter. Uh, and once again, that book came out, it was some, there should have been an inquiry after that by the Institute of Psychiatry, the British Psychological Society. But once again, nothing happened. Oh, well, no appropriate authority dealt with that. Uh, then for to celebrate Isaac's centenary, Personality and Differences, which was another journal that he founded. He was its first editor. His wife, Sybil Ising, was its second editor. And to celebrate his 100th centenary, the, the, that journal decided they would do a, a, a special issue to celebrate his life and his work. And the editor, who is, a, 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 any dealings I've had, seems a very, even-handed uh, uh, professor of psychology doing his best to provide balance uh, in in his dealings with Hans, clearly someone who greatly admired Hans Isink, but trying nevertheless to acknowledge the, co the controversy around him. And he asked me to do an article uh, talking about giving an update about personality and fatal diseases. And I do remember I've got an email somewhere saying, are you really sure you want me to contribute to this? Are you absolutely certain about this? And the poor man then got uh, an article for me from me. And I, 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 it was uh, in the autumn, I think, of, of 2015, he got this article from me. And uh, he then went, went over it, you know, commenting on it uh, um, uh, and, and, and I think realising more and more here, wait a minute, this is, this is not what I was hoping to put in a, in, an, in a centenary celebration of Professor Isink's life. And he was the guest editor of this, of this uh, journal, of this, uh, of this special issue. And he was sent it to a couple of um, referees and I then made some changes, but mainly he sent it to uh, Elsevier's lawyers and they gave very, very detailed pages of uh, comments on it. And I made changes and mainly, the main thing was softening the, two, well, there was two main things. It, it was coming across as if I was the only person criticising this work 
or me and Lewis Appleby. And, and it was just the way I had done the, the references. So I changed it to make it clear there was dozens of people had done terribly serious criticisms of this work. But also they wanted me to soften the tone and soften certain um, 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 criticisms I was making. I, I do remember they, they were saying, you cannot say this, some of this is a, cr a, a criminally negligent study in print. And I changed it accordingly. I, I softened things like that. And, and I did soften the tone. Uh, uh, Philip Corr went back and suggested, it kind of rewrote it for me, tried a rewrite, uh, keeping still criticism. But uh, as I said, I would have cut off my hand, chewed off my hand, right before I put my name to the to, 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 to this rewrite of it, because it would have come across again as experts disagree about this work. Um, Philip, Philip Corr sent, then sent it to another seven uh, referees and ended up, so end up getting nine referees reports, one of which said an outright rejection, another one of which said uh, write a, different, a completely different article about it, another seven uh, were, uh, some were glowing in the praise and, and some made suggestions saying it had to be, it wasn't critical enough. And uh, so Philip Corr went through, uh, Philip Corr then accepted it. And there it is, that, there it is, article in press for the special issue of personality and individual differences. I do remember being very, very pleased. I corrected the proofs and that was the, the I think these were the final proofs that I got. And uh, then the editor in chief emailed me to say, no, we're rejecting it. Uh, I'd, 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 I'd actually paid, I paid uh, two and a half thousand euros to make open access, paid Elsevier. My God, that, that's quite a company, Elsevier, for the money, for the, getting money. But two and a half thousand euros, they gave me my money back, but it was spiked at the last minute. And uh, I got a, I got a photocopied copy of the journal. That's what I got for all that, all the work I'd done. And I, I then I then submitted it, once again asking, how could this happen? How is this all happening? How could this stuff still be in the literature? And nothing can be done about it. So I ended up submitting the article to, I think it was 12 other journals. And understandably, some people said, look, this is, this is old hat stuff and it's been written before. Other people say it's far too long. Uh, we, we can't do that. But, but some of the journals were very upfront about this, saying, well, look, we don't have the resources. If this le leads on to, into legal action, we don't have the resources to deal with that. So we, we regretfully they rejected it. Very nice and very supportive. I think al almost all of the journals were supportive of me uh, and saying, you know, this is good work, but we just can't, we're not, we're not going to publish it. And, and uh, well, I was going to give up, but I said, I'll try this Journal of Health Psychology. And, and it was David Marks, and I'm very grateful to him. Uh, he leapt at it. And, and once again, I think he, he wrote a, a supporting editorial, but I think most importantly, he sent it to King's College London, that is the university to which Institute of Psychiatry is now attached. Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. So they're attached to King's College London, and he sent this to the principal uh, of of King's College London, and I think then it gave King's College no option but to do an inquiry into it. So it was really David Marks who 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 precipitated what I'd be, we'd been asking for years this inquiry into this work, and uh, out it came. Then, well, it, it was it, it came in May two thousand and nineteen. It only was made public in the autumn of two thousand, September two thousand nineteen. And they looked at the, the, the publications that were co-authored by Isaac and Grossarth Matichek. They didn't look at the single authored publications by Professor Isaac in this area. And, uh, but nevertheless said this work is unsafe, wrote to the editors. And now uh, uh, so far it's 15 publications from four of the journals. Um, have retracted paper uh, uh, the publications from this. 
personality and individual differences. Uh, uh, the editors, the associate editors, and uh, all the editors and the senior associate editors, they decided they wouldn't retract this work because it wasn't clear if, if Ising deliberately was fraudulent. They talked about something about his motivation, so they only made expressions of concern. I think they're making a big mistake there. Um, behavior research and therapy apparently are still looking into it. I chased them up for the purpose of this talk. Three other three other journals who have so far not commented. They're saying they're still looking into it, and and I understand one another one of the journals is going to retract to the, the paper mentioned. A journal called the Journal of Social, Political and Economic Studies which is published, the editor is a chap called Pearson, who is a, a famous, really political thinker and a, a famous uh, an, an, a, 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 a thinker on eugenics. And his, his, his journals mainly revolves around uh, uh, eugenic issues. Uh, he, he just hasn't replied at all, despite being chased up a, few a couple of times, hasn't replied at all. I don't know what's happening there. And uh, Rod Buchanan wrote, um, um, made a statement, uh, wrote in, I think, to the, to the British Medical Journal saying, look, there was 20, the, the King's College has recommended retraction of 27 papers, 26 papers uh, should be retracted. Uh, and he said, no, that's way, way short of the real total. Rod's estimate is it should be around about 88 papers in total, so another 60 odd papers, single authored by Ising in this field should be retracted. And we'll wait and see what happens there. And and and, and that's kind of it for now. I'm hoping there'll be a good discussion. I, I, would, I would love a discussion with an audience about this, uh, but I hope there'll be a good discussion. And I thought I should just end with this picture of Hans Eising at the Institute of Psychiatry, I think it was, and I just thought I should maybe just remind everybody up here at the top right hand corner. No smoking. Uh, and I'll see it'll be interesting what you make it all. Tony, that, that was that absolutely, absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Thank you, Thank so, you much so much for your much time. time. Um, um, there's a bit of an a bit echo. Of an echo. So I'm just going to mute, mute you, okay, Tony, and, and, and then you just, then you just unmute when uh, when it's your turn to uh, to answer the questions. So uh, just a quick note to everybody: if I could ask you to submit questions in the Q and A uh, box, which you should see at the side of your screen, there's already a number of questions. Uh, there's one actually from uh, Professor Robin Murray. Um, so I'll just start with his question. So as you know, Tony, I was the Dean of the IOP when this research in quotation marks started. And I had a number of other problems with Hans Ising, mainly in relation to race and IQ, but this hadn't surfaced. Do you think that he had always been a crook or do you think he was uh, losing his cognitive capacities and was misled by his colleague producing all these results on accord with his theories? Sorry, Tony, could you just unmute yourself? Sorry. I don't think that Professor Isink was all was a was always a crook. And I think a lot of his work is good and important work. I do think that the burden the kind of burden of proof has now changed, and I actually think there should be expressions of concern about all of his work. Unless there, one of his collaborators who's still alive writes in, if his collaborators write in and say, no, we'll be the guarantors for that, then, then that would be fine, remove the expression of concern. But I, I think he was someone who believed what he believed. I. I think he did have, although people, will be, others will be more able to judge this than me, I think he did have an issue about 
statistical significance and effect size. And I think he saw scientific argument as something he would just go around trying to find statistically significant results. If he could find a statistically significant result, he would use that one if it backed up his his uh, his beliefs that he had he'd come to a prob an issue with. And I think that that the riots club. It's the kind of stuff that the Rights Club seems to me anyway to be grappling with and trying to help the whole scientific community not get to get into that of just using statistical significant results to support people's own views. I, I think it is absolutely, I, 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 couldn't, uh, I couldn't believe for a minute that somehow Professor Grossarth Matichek influenced Hans Isink to produce this work. I mean, I can just imagine the conversations these two had with Hans Isaac saying, to her, I've, got a, I've got a great idea and it's based on theory and it's a really important hypothesis. I've even got some data to support it. And Gross Arthur is saying, I've got data on that. I must, I'll go and have a look at my data on that. And then we come up and say, oh, I've got this great idea that maybe public health campaigns could actually stress people out and it could maybe even increase their risk of getting cancer if they have a public health campaign against cigarettes. And just imagine Isaac goes out my sake saying, oh, I've got, oh, I, I, I might have some data on that and then coming and giving him what he wanted. Uh, and, and so this hugely powerful personality with Grossard Maticek, who, uh, I mean, in a, in a way I feel, I've, I, well, a, a great tragedy, the man's still alive and in his 80s. Uh, and and uh, my, um, a million miles out of his depth with all this. So I can't, can't blame Grossard Maciek. I don't believe all of Isaac's work is crooked, but I personally think there should nevertheless be expressions of concern about everything he's done, every book, every paper, until somebody else could then be the guarantor for it, because you can't trust him to be the guarantor because of what he's done here and in other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for that. Uh, and good to hear from Robin again. <laughs> yeah, fellow, fellow Glaswegian, I think. This is, this is weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. D d whilst we're in King's College, I just wanted to read out something um, that was sent to us from the Research Integrity Office. Um, and uh, so I'll just read it out verbatim. So they say, uh, we noticed that the Right uh, Science Club is hosting Dr. Anthony Pelosi next week to discuss the Hans Eisen case. Anthony was in touch with us earlier in the year to ask for an update on whether KCL would investigate the singly authored publications that, that, that rely on the same data set as those already deemed unsafe. Um, we let him know that we will be looking into these. We are about to begin an initial screening phase for this investigation and we're happy for you to share that at the event next week if anyone asks for an update from King's. Good. So watch this space. Now, um, what I wanted to go on to is actually we, we have a reply from Philip Kaur, uh, Tony. Good. So I can read I can read What's this out. Thing? Good to hear from Philip again. Yeah. Uh, I'll read this out to you. So um, it is a, it is a, it's the sort of the length of a typical question asked by uh, Grossoff Maschek. So um, just I'll try and break it up for you. Um, so Philip Kaur. I was the editor of the Personality and Individual Differences special issue. I wanted Tony's paper to be published, but the tone, not the content, was unacceptable to Elsevier's lawyers. Tony was not willing to revise sufficiently, so the paper had a more appropriate academic tone. It was not uh, the, uh, the case that uh, it was not the case that I uh, or the personality individual differences or Elsevier were trying to suppress an uncomfortable set of conclusions. Quite the contrary, these would only add to the vitality of the Isaac story where controversy is at its core, where I covered, uh, which I covered in my 2016 biography of Isaac, subtitled A Contradictory Psychology. Very where, yeah, where many criticisms of Ising's work were recorded and there is a whole chapter on personality and cancer slash CHD, which includes Tony's seminal contribution to this debate, Philip Core. So we can leave that there. I don't know whether you want to. Very good, though, but, but 
I do. If, if Philip over now will be listening, I, I take it and is 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 at the meeting, and that's why. God, if it was an audience. I mean, I've been wanting this for a year. Remember, remember, Philip, I was saying, I'll fly down. I'll fly down and see you, Philip. Don't worry, I'll come and see you. Eh, eh, will you invite me to a talk? Please, Philip, invite me to a talk. I'll explain it. And and and, and, I, and I must say, it was it was actually, a, in, in many ways, a pleasure working with Philip. But it, it was from Philip that I got the word beguiled, that Isaac beguiled people. And I do, Philip, you must speak to the other people at the, in the International Society for Individual Differences, the other, the senior, uh, what do you may call it, office holders, and just put it to them. You have been beguiled by this powerful, powerful personality. And so, and so when you put your name to a, then a published peer review article, showing a, a relative risk of 1.02 for each point in a in a in in an I gross art match and Isaac's questionnaire for increasing the risk of coronary artery disease. And 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 then say, oh and it's statistically significant. We found statistically significant result. This supports some of Isaac's and Growth Arts Math Check's work. Please speak to them. This must stop. Because they then compare it with Isaac's work. And for some of his studies, there were infinite uh, uh, relative risks. And, and Philip, you, it must stop. And I think actually I'm hoping the Riots Club will stop it forever. And this scandal will stop it forever. Finding a statistically significant result somewhere does not deal with people making the most important claims ever in the history of medicine or science. There you are, Phil. Oh, we must have a discussion one day. We've only ever uh, done by, by by email and things. Yeah. Anyway. Well, hopefully this this uh, talk will will be a catalyst for many more invites because yeah. I think. Uh, if we're not enthralled by this topic, we're enthralled by your your mellifluous Glaswegian accent, haven't we? So <laughs> you're quite a you're quite uh, a combo. Uh, God, it's so weird. <laughs> uh, um, we have a question from um, Fran, and um, they ask: Was it an open secret at conferences and in conversation uh, that this was all tosh? Uh, what about review boards? Was it ever discussed openly? It, it, it was gossiped about, and I think and, and Rod, Rod Buchanan has written about that, the, the, all the gossip that went on. It was it was discussed openly at tobacco industry uh, meetings and in memos. So in the minutes of the minutes of meetings, it was discussed. Uh, it was written about by tobacco industry scientists. Uh, when when Professor Isaac went to uh, talk in Edinburgh, and I'd ask, oh, could, could we not both be there? I, I gave a talk in the, the University of Edinburgh in the early 90s. Uh, uh, but there, there would be Isaac giving these unbelievable results, and some of the audience were writing this down carefully and checking it. And as you say, look, this p-value is less than 0 0.01. Um, uh, but but we, and we we tried then to I tried to George Davies Smith tried to point out the how outrageous this was, and and I think I got the impression from Professor Eisen all he cared about was some sort of rhetorical win in an in an argument. He didn't particularly care about what anybody was saying. But I I, I, I don't know. I think we'd have to ask Philip if he's there. Philip Philip is still there. Was this discussed? at the psychology meetings. Was it discussed when you were giving uh, these special special lectures uh, in, in Isaac's name? Did anybody ever try to explain it to his, his, his wife, who, his, his late wife who died after all this, now has reared its head again? Was it ever discussed amongst the people in the International Society the study of individual differences and in, in other psychology forums. So I think I have to ask the psychologists here uh, as well. 
Well, uh, Philip actually responded. As I should warn you that there's like a 30, 20, 30 second delay. So Philip might be a bit delayed in responding if, if he does respond. And I know we've gone past the hour, but what he did say in response to what you said before, he said, good point, Tony. No one at the uh, ISSID believe the results of this work. Um, so no what, well, yeah. So that's See, a it's an, and it's a shame because it's another layer of scandal, though, because they're saying that they they're saying that they've found some data to support Isaacson Gross Earth Matichek's work. I mean, I, how could this be happening? You have okay, to sort. So this. we have we have a response from Philip. So few, if any, belie uh, people believed uh, these unbelievable data. So it is quite remarkable. There's, there, there is um, a question that was asked, which I'll try and feed into a one that I wanted to ask as well, because in your 2019 paper, you um, you cite uh, Hans's son, Michael Isink, um, and one of the people that in the audience asked, um, did you ever have any personal correspondence with Isink regarding these issues? And I guess, did you have any personal correspondence with, with Michael as well? And, no, I didn't. I didn't. I, I one one of one of Ising's arguments when we wrote this article in the British Medical Journal, in ninety, you know, in nineteen ninety two, a peer reviewed journal, he was saying, but this was so this was so easy to answer. It makes you wonder what the motivation of Pelosi and Appleby was to be so critical. All they needed to do was write to me, and I could have explained what it was all about which is not the way science works, that you write to an individual and get them to, to reply. And, and, I, and I've, got to be, I've got to be honest, there, there was then times when I then was, for example, when I approached the British Psychological Society, I was thinking, people kept telling me, you have to be just a bit careful because you could find yourselves in, in, legal, in, a legal, in, in, a, in, in legal proceedings. So I was being careful to try to frame what I was saying according to what the lawyers had allowed us to publish in the British Medical Journal. And at, at that time in, in my life, if, if, if there had been some sort of affirmative sort of legal proceedings, it would have been very difficult for me, not for money, but also for, for time. Now, I mean, now everything, I just want to say everything, absolutely everything I say is strictly on the record. And I take full soul and total responsibility for anything that then is on the website is strictly on the record. But I'm still holding a few things back. <laughs> 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 but, 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 uh, yeah, well, it's, it's one thing that I wanted to ask you actually, and it's something that was in your abstract too, which is, you know, how did this happen? And you did a wonderful podcast interview with the guardian and one of the things you said that that hans was had a remarkable sort of personality i guess quite um in the sense that he could just be a unique individual and it um sir michael rutter gave a, a sort of informal talk for the sgdp uh, a few years ago now where he did describe how Hans would just bulldoze people, uh, you know, he would he would be very effective at uh, argu uh, argumentation and and debate. And he had one of those personalities that could just could do that. Um, and when you think of other cases like, say, Diedrich Starple uh, or even Andy Wakefield, um, these people have sort of remarkable motivation to either believe what they they think is the case or they get up high on their own supply you know after years of churning this stuff out they do believe it so what what do you think was special about hands and, and if nothing was special if he was say a product of i don't know circumstance or whatever i don't know but is there anything that we can learn from hands because this is the sorry that this is a very long-winded question but what i'm trying to get at it is is there any lessons that we can learn from hands that would be relevant today? Yeah, and it's it's such an important 
question, Sam, and I do wonder though if there are people bet more qualified than me to answer this, especially when you see something like the, the Riots Club and, and, and all the, the work that's been done on questionable research practices and and indeed in, in uh, unethical research practices or unscientific research practices, that, that uh, it's such, a, such important work. But I do wonder if someone like Hans Isink the, is is such an outlier that there aren't so many lessons to learn about what he did. But there has to somehow or other be a way that if if there are a thoughtful, serious criticisms, somehow or other the people responsible for looking into that I have to do their work or, or outsource it to someone, to, to a trusted uh, group. David Marks wants some sort of ombudsperson involved. I think, I think it would have to be the universities doing all the work and then handing it to the, to the, to the ombudsman, a well-resourced ombudsperson to do this, to try to deal with Hans Isink. Uh, but I, I, I just, I wonder if he, someone like that, something like science, the way it's set up, it can't cope with a man like that. And if someone like Diedrich Staple, for example, who's much more upfront in his own mind about it all, if he had been just a bit brighter, Staple, his stuff would still have been coming, turning out, and, and, and science wouldn't really have been able to deal with it. Um, I do think uh, Hans I is an outlier in all these things though and uh, um, you know the, uh, and I don't and I don't and I don't think honest and and uh, honest and decent scientists uh, have that much to learn from him and I and I would like to say as well the people who have collaborated with him over the years they do not deserve the fact that some of them are already having expressions of concern. Some of them are having uh, papers retracted. Poor Gross Arthematic Check is separate from this, but I, th I think it is it's a shame that there is going to be collateral damage from this. If, for example, 85 or 86 or 87 papers uh, are, 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 with, are retracted because there are, there are some good, really excellent scientists and, and uh, who, who are going to, who are part of that and who are co-authors on these, some of these things. Yeah, uh, didn't, didn't really answer that, but anyways, no, no, it's, you more did. Right, it's more for you and the rights people mm. to, to be answering. <laughs> well, um, you did because it, it actually, maybe that's a distraction, maybe it's not the individual and rather it's how could science be set up to deal with the aftermath of these individuals? And I think that's where we're we're running into um, treacle because um, it's something that actually was mentioned on the Everything Hurts podcast, and James Heather's brought it up, which is where does Hans sort of fall in? Is it you know some of his work could be just that work that you could class as well that was later sub uh, um, superseded by subsequent refu refutations and failed replications. But then there's also the, the sticky stuff, which is the, the fabricated fraudulent and then there's the unethical and there doesn't seem to be a way to sell uh, to have a nuanced way to self correct for all of these different things. Yeah. And yeah, and I think this is the thing that's been most troubling about the, the King's sort of inquiry, if you like, is the fact that what what do they mean by unsafe? Yeah. And how do they deal with that? Do they is it retraction? Is it just flagged as being unsafe? How do that? What do we do when it's already happened? And and and, and I don't I don't have the answer to that. Mm. And 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 I think this time round, I hope Kings will think they have a have a good discussion amongst scientists about this. And I, I appreciate that. I suspect their lawyer, all, as always, will go through the final inquiry. So it then becomes a, a legal person who absolutely dominates the language around it. And and I think it, it does 
and that's the lawyer's jobs. It does though fudge. It, it, it means then that, for example, we don't know that the International Society for Individual Differences, none of them believed it, but no one can actually say it. So, so I think it, I think this is for I think it's for the universities. I think maybe groups like this and the scientific community and and uh, learned organisations to to actually be upfront and, and and deal with this. Okay, great. So we're we're at half one now, but we can right. just carry on. But I don't want to keep you hostage um, because this is really uh, the the perk of being the chair here. So I'm sorry to have gone on to have no, there because it because it's a bit longer than do not apologize at yeah. all. We usually hemorrhage quite a few uh, people after the hour, but we've we've managed to retain people. So people here until the bitter end, I think. So uh, there's just a few questions that I want to um, answer uh, for completeness because uh, people have asked them. Um, one of them was uh, I can't find it exactly, but um, about sort of the potential personal cost. Um, you know, were you ever sort of fearful of, uh, of blowback personally or otherwise, um, given that he's such a, you know, pervasive person in the in the field? <laughs> no, 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 it really has been, uh, it's not been a worry, it's, except my, you know, when you go to muse a museum with your boys and they're fed, oh, come on, Dad, let's go to the, let's go to the Natural History Museum. I didn't want to go to the Science Museum. So it's important, yes, you are. And, and then especially when I think it, it was when I was doing all this thing with Philip Corr. Philip, Philip uh, if he's still there, you'll remember Philip sending me one of the referees report. And it said something like, this, this article is a paradigm for a critical scientific review. So I started going on for the next day, uh, I think week, to my family saying, do you realise you're speaking to the author of a paradigmatic scientific review? <laughs> and I remember telling, telling Philip, 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 you should never have told me that. You never told me that. My wife is now going around saying, would you shut up, you? I can take no more of this. There, there's three of us in this marriage. You, me, and Hans Isink. This is ridiculous. So it, it, it's been, in many ways, it's been... Uh, I suppose great fun actually. I was I was warned about this thing about legal action, and once again, this is all on the record. I was warned about this legal thing. Legal action. I said, well, 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 who cares? I mean, my my niece is a lawyer. That'd be quite good. I mean, we'll employ it. We'll employ my niece. Well, that'd be quite good. I fancy that. There, you know, you stand up for truth. But uh, people find it, you know, you, you shouldn't be like that in regard to, to legal proceedings. So uh, there has been not been any personal cost, except when I thought that time I'd done all that work and in, 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 in all the two and four with Philip and, and the Saviour's lawyer. And, and, you know, like the 12th rejection, you start saying, oh, this is, I mean, I'm a busy man. I can't do that. So I think that then I felt I did feel a bit demoralised at that stage, but no, no personal cost. Well, on on, thank thanks to your family then I guess for yeah. for, for, for giving you a bit of uh, wiggle room to do this because uh, yeah. yeah. you've been an absolute remarkable contributor to, to this um, ongoing saga. Just a couple of things as well. So James Heather's. Um, uh, as, as, thanks for the shout out. He's got quite strong opinions on this. I, I bet he has. Um, it would be nice actually to see you both talking about this. I don't know whether something could happen. Um, Philip Corr uh, says, steady on, Tony. Uh, steady on, yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks. For, and, I, and I was to thank Philip for that, actually, uh, over over the since 2000 and uh, 2000, uh, can't remember, 18 to the 2000. I want to thank Philip. Sorry, because I go on. Yes, thank you, Philip. Um, oh, Rod Buchanan is in the audience. Um, let me just publish his question. Let me find it. Um, so, hi, Tony. Has RGM actually started any legal action or just threatened it? No, no, no he's, he, as far as I know, he's only threatened it. 
And there's something on his website where he's obviously written to a lawyer. I, I get the impression. I don't know if Rod, Rod's noticed that, but it, I've, I've not heard anything about uh, legal proceedings. Uh, I did hear. I did hear from his son, who's a journalist. He wrote me, wrote me a very nice, very polite email, but pointing out that he was a journalist and uh, in in, in uh, uh, quite big newspapers in 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 Germany. And, and I don't know if he was trying to say, look, you know, stop, stop being critical of my dad. He said, could you send me a copy of your paper? Uh, I, I did hear from him. But uh, Grosso Macek on his website is, is quite a few things saying he's going to take legal action against me and David Marks and I think against King's College as well, but he hasn't done so. Mm. Right. Um, let me just have a look through the questions. Um, and and, and probably, probably looking through, yeah. I think I think Rod's Rod's book. Uh, my understanding from Rod's book was that it, there were Im important changes that the, the lawyers insisted on, that Oxford University Press's lawyers insisted on, which, you know. <sighs> It, it, there has to be these legal legal rules and and uh, the the possibility of you know protection against defamation, but such such a, a detailed and scholarly book and careful book. This is not just someone shooting off their mouth to criticise someone. But, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think we've covered um, all the. The questions. Um, there's a few others um, which I think indirectly you've you've answered uh, in any case. So we can come to uh, an organic close. I just wanted to because Tony, you were at the IOP, right? Um, and you were there, I guess, when Hans was there. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you were telling me about your your tennis uh, antics. Yeah. Because, go on. Do you want to? Well, he, yeah, and he he would he would always uh, it was well known about for for him and his uh, research workers being on the tech getting to the tennis court at lunchtime, uh, and and they were they were all very very keen tennis players. But uh, just that there was a spell in the, the mid eighties, uh, it must be eighty seven eighty eight. Uh, it's, it's 60, 70, 80, but there was an, an even keener group of young doctors, even keener on tennis. So we would be running down to get to the tennis court at the Bodsley before Isaac uh, and his and his colleagues. Uh, uh, there was no ill feeling from, on any part about around mm -hmm. tennis. I hope anyway. Yeah, I heard that he would he would do it at lunchtime. Yes, and and purposefully grunt and groan just to tick everybody else off. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I think I got that from Michael Rutter. I think I think <laughs> not to drag his name or anything. Yeah. Robin Murray actually has just responded, so I think we'll finish on on this. But um, Robin says, um, of course, we should ask whether any of this would have happened if Ising hadn't been supported by the tobacco companies. We have excluded their influence now, but the alcohol and increasingly the uh, cannabis companies are up to the same game. Gosh, and I, um, I, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But at, towards the end, I think even the tobacco companies realized even at the uh, the peak of the most unethical realizing it wait a minute this is just getting too ridiculous um and it's a it's a great question to end on and it certainly wouldn't have it as as much money and as much dissemination of his work and uh, and and maybe as well you know for example that book if anyone i think it's 120 pounds I'm putting it forward as the worst book about med about medical matters ever published outside totalitarian states. I'm putting it forward as my nomination for the worst book ever written, Smoking Personality, and worst medical book ever written. It's about 150, 160 quid, I think, to buy now. Still available, 
from Springer, I think it is, Springer. But it's, uh, it's available in full on the Tobacco Documents website in the files of a variety of drug com um, of uh, tobacco companies just sitting there available available for all before it was sent on to Springer. You know, so the manuscripts are all sitting there if anybody wants a quick look at it. And you do wonder what their influence, their, uh, the, their overall influence has been without them necessarily in individually influencing Hans' beliefs and his beliefs in himself. Wonderful. Well, yeah. I guess I guess the next thing to do is to just encourage everybody to get engaged with this and uh, put their heads together and take a look at um, Tony's abstract where he invites people to think of um, the different important aspects of the, the whole Isaac case. Um, and hopefully we can carry the, the torch, uh, Tony, and, and not leave it all up to you and a select few of en enthusiastic people who, who uh, drag their children through museums of <laughs> minimal interest to a child. <laughs> um, so, Tony, seriously, this has been a, an absolutely incredibly enjoyable and highlight of my um, time as uh, a member of the Right Science Club. So thank you for that very much. Um, and I, I guess we can we can close it there unless you have any final words. Or anything well, thanks very much, Sam, and th thanks very much for everybody's uh, attention. Uh, it would be great to have a, a talk sometime and yes. discussion and then absolutely fine after it as well. So that, thanks very much indeed right. to everybody right. and best wishes especially to Philip Corr and, and Robin and Robert, Robert. but best wishes to Philip and and uh, uh, Thanks for inviting me to write that article in many ways, yeah. Thank you. Take care. Uh, right, so I'll end this, and Tony, you can stay on the call, but I'll just end the live stream. So um, see you later, everybody.